Hello, I'm Nadia Bilchik, and every week I've been bringing you updates on COVID-19 with the three doctors Bilchik, Anton Bilchik, Brian Bilchik, and Tanya Bilchik. Today I'm joined by one of the doctors Bilchik, cancer surgeon, my brother, Dr. Anton Bilchik. Anton, a quick update about what is happening in your world right now with COVID-19. Well, hi, uh, Nadia. I, I do miss my, my other siblings, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do this on our own, and I'm sure they'll have something to, to say in the near future. But as I've said last week, um, every week just seems like a lifetime. So much has changed since we, since we last spoke. Uh, I think in, in my world, the two major things are um, operating rooms are starting to open up, um, elective surgeries are, are now starting to be performed at, in some hospitals, in some cities around the country. Um, I think that the reality has kicked in uh, regarding people that have been waiting for operations that are now having um, the side effects of not having the operation. Um, so it becomes a really a, a risk, you know, a risk uh, uh, reward kind of a situation because the longer some of these people wait, the worse shape they're going to be in. So um, hospitals have, um, you know, decided to start doing elective surgery, but doing it in a very responsible way. I don't think uh, any hospital wants to, uh, right now to take on um, people that are very sick, uh, patients who may require blood transfusions or may require use of the intensive care unit. Um, so I think that, that uh, most hospitals are, are trying to start with more um, simple surgeries, um, outpatient procedures, uh, and uh, at the same time to, to keep both the patient and the, the healthcare personnel safe. So um, the way that um, uh, hospitals are going about it is uh, testing patients for COVID. Um, some patients are getting um, COVID tested at the hospital that they're getting the, oper the uh, operation at. Others are getting COVID tested uh, by their uh, uh, general uh, practitioner or their uh, internist. And healthcare personnel are still taking precautions as if every person that they're operating on is a potential COVID patient. So, so are you saying it in the Los Angeles area, more testing is available? Um, more testing is available, but not enough is being done. This is a, um, not unique to Los Angeles, but really the um, California and most of the West Coast, um, where um, uh, most of the cities have, have, have uh, plateaued. And um, although we're still dealing with a, a lot of uh, COVID patients throughout um, California and Portland and the state of Washington, um, the hospitals have capacity. And I think that's really the key thing is part of the reason for not performing um, elective operations is to uh, create capacity within the hospitals, not to overwhelm the system. And um, uh, certainly within California and uh, other hospitals um, in many uh, states, um, there's the, the, the intensive care units are, are managing and the emergency rooms are managing. And so there is there is capacity, and that's really um, an important, um, you know, reason why uh, elective surgeries are um, slowly starting up. Now, um, having having said that, even though other states such as New York have uh, plateaued, um, their hospitals are still overwhelmed with um, patients on ventilators and in intensive care units. In some cases, um, anesthesia ventilators are needed for um, COVID patients. So um, even, even though um, New York has, um, you know, has, has plateaued, there are really many of the hospitals are unable to start elective surgery. So this really, there, there are many factors that, that, that are taken into account, but uh, for, the, you know, for the patient sitting at home that's been, now been waiting four weeks, six weeks for an operation for cataracts or um, for a hip operation, um, one really has to start thinking about the consequences if they don't have surgery, if they don't move around, they can't walk around because they, 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 they've got, you know, severe hip problems. Does that put them at, at, at risk for falling? Does that put them at risk for getting blood clots and, 
um, to the lung uh, pneumonia. There's also uh, been a lot of discussion uh, since a lot of the emergency rooms um, have been relatively empty um, over the last few weeks. And, and again, in some cities, e e every city is different that some people who should be coming to emergency rooms are not because they're really fearful of coming to emergency rooms. So this is all, again, just happened in, in, in a week. Um, you know, we, 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 now, now this is, uh, it's, it's a moving target. Things can change in a millisecond. If there is another surge, um, elective surgeries, I have no doubt, will be canceled again. But um, the, this, the, there's been a lot of movement to get hospitals moving again. There's also a, a big um, you know, financial concern among hospital systems, since as we discussed before, uh, you know, hospitals generate uh, revenue um, through surgical procedures. And um, it's really important to keep hospitals um, functioning and to maintain um, some, some revenue because a lot of the money that is being lent to hospitals um, by the, the government, these loans, eventually are going to have to be paid back. So, there's the, the, so, so we really are in a, in a very transitional um, time uh, as far as getting, um, getting hospitals moving again, getting surgeries going again, but at the same time being really responsible to protect uh, patients and, and healthcare workers. So something you said last time that we spoke, you said there was still a shortage of PPE, protective gear, masks and gowns. And has that continued? Has that improved? I think that's, that's really a, 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 you know, that's a, it's a national problem. Um, I, I think that uh, that's something that um, uh, hospital workers in, in general still feel that there needs to be more, more PPE. Um, whether it's you know, improved uh, or not, I think again, it's just, it's different between um, hospital systems. I know um, our, our hospital system has been really innovative in, in um, uh, uh, repurposing masks, um, in uh, encouraging uh, people to make their own masks out of materials. Um, and um, I think there's also been a lot of, you know, philanthropy and donations and people really trying to help um, healthcare workers. So I still think that uh, there, there is general uh, concern. I, I'm sure you, um, you, you saw the uh, uh, intensive care unit uh, nurse from Arizona being interviewed during that standoff with protesters. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Well, oh, it, oh, no, 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 cancel. Sorry, you were telling us about a nurse who was involved in a protest. I watched that interview. It was incredibly moving. Yeah, that really was one of the most um, moving interviews that, that I have ever seen. Uh, a young intensive care unit uh, nurse in Arizona standing off uh, protesters um, who um, felt that it was their Second Amendment right to not stay at home. And here you had this um, uh, very articulate, caring um, intensive care unit nurse saying, I'm here to represent my patients. Um, she was uh, clearly in the front, is in the front lines, has been taking care of these COVID patients every day, um, has not taken any time off, has been working 12 hour shifts. And she, she pointed out um, some issues that, that I think are, are so relevant and so important, and that is, some of these patients die alone. And she's had, she had to experience um, uh, having to FaceTime with other family members and just the sheer emotional toll that it's taken um, on both the healthcare personnel as well as patients, as well as their families. And she felt um, the need just to stand there and represent um, her colleagues and her patients, but she just did it in such a um, masterful, um, compassionate way, just by standing and and you know, with her, her eyes said everything, and that was really one of the most moving um, interviews that, that 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 I've seen in a long time. And I, the reason it meant so much to me is that I work with these people every day, and I see how much the intensive care unit uh, nurses put into this, and how much they care. And so, um, for them to you know, stand up to people saying, well, you know, we're, we're not really sure we're going to listen to 
um, curves or we're not going to, we're not going to listen to social distancing. It's our right not to. And she has all these um, young people. And, and I think she, she um, told the story of one of the first COVID per, uh, patients that she took care of who was someone that was her age. So she made the point that this is not just about old people or young kids. It was someone her age that, that, uh, that died from COVID. And so it was a very, very close to home. And I, I, I just encourage all of your viewers to, to watch that interview uh, again and again, because uh, it was such a moving moment that says so much about what's going on. So Dr. Anton Bilchik, Anton, my brother, giving us a COVID uh, update. Just final, what do you want to say to people who are really resisting this lockdown now? The urge is now to get out. Well, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Governor Kemp has said, in fact, you can because massage parlors and hairdressers and, oh, tattoo parlors are open too. So just your, your basic advice at this point of dealing with the crisis. Well, I, I think that um, there, there are two um, major points. Number one is that uh, the more we learn about testing, the more confusing it is for us. And, we've, and, and, and what I'm really referring to are um, the sensitivity, for example, of some of the COVID testing. Some is very sensitive, some is not. So that means that some of the tests, um, people are pretty sure that they're negative when there's only a 60% chance of it being correct. So that means there's a 40% chance that the test is wrong. The second thing, which has really been a big point of discussion this week, is people running out and getting antibody testing. Um, and people want to get antibody tested. So explain what, if you went for an antibody test and it said, yes, you are positive for having the antibodies, what would that mean? Well, that's the whole, that's the whole point, is that um, being positive to an antibody test means that either you have the virus and your body's responding to it, or you had the virus and your body has built up um, antibody, um, antibody, immunity. antibody's immunity, has built, has built up immunity. The problem is that people are getting, you want to get tested with the understanding that they are safe to go out, that they're not gonna infect others and that they're not gonna get infected themselves. And what we're learning is that nobody knows at this point, what the antibody testing means. And so that's not a, um, a, a, a reason to carry on life as normal based on a test that is still being looked at. And, the, the, and, and this, I think, again, that's why I, we started off the discussion with how much has happened in a week. Um, I, I, a week ago, I, I really thought that I understood so much more about antibody testing than I do today. A week ago, I thought I could, um, you know, perhaps start recommending that uh, to to people to um, get us get get certain antibody uh, tests, get the FDA approved um, test, and that that would perhaps um, provide them a better understanding of how safe they they are in their workplace around their families. Now I don't know, um, and this is again just in a week. So when it comes to uh, you know what, um, if I do just give one message to to every person out there. And what, what I'm saying is what every um, healthcare professional is saying is you have to listen to the scientists and you have to listen to the science. Um, the, um, the, you know, the stay at home clearly um, has, has worked. That's why uh, several uh, cities have plateaued. Social distancing um, clearly is um, an, an effective way of um, keeping the virus away. Wearing, wearing a mask is important. And, and I think that we, we do need to um, reopen business, reopen hospitals, but, but it has to be done in a responsible way. And that's how um, scientists are, are looking at, at this. The other thing that I have to tell you again, and I, I, the more I think about how much has happened in a week, this has just been seven days, has been all this discussion about chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, uh, the drug that, um, that uh, uh, has, supposed you know, to help with malaria, discussed. correct? C correct, and um, um, and the ZPAC or uh, azithromycin. So that and the new antiviral drug that's being it's, that's being used, remdesivir. So but it's all come just, out as just, a myth, just, right? Well, it, we you know so the um, the VA trial, the the hydrochloric 
Cochrane VA trial was a negative trial, meaning that um, it not only did not work, but there, were t there was toxicity with that drug, uh, specifically cardiac tox toxicity. And if we go back to one of the discussions with Brian, our brother, the cardiologist, um, about uh, drugs like uh, hydro hydrochloroquine, he actually um, said, listen, um, these, these drugs have toxicity on the heart. People need to be careful. And now you have a VA study that really confirms that there, that not only did it not work, but that there were um, yeah, more, more side effects. Now, again, that doesn't mean that there may not be um, hydrochloroquine studies down the road, that there may be a subset of patients that it, benefit, that it benefits. We just don't know. But at, at least of now, the FDA is not recommending that as a treatment for all patients with, with COVID virus. Then there was a lot of hope resting on the, the antiviral drug remdesivir from, from the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company Gilead. Well, that trial um, so far in, in sick patients is a negative trial. Now that does, again, does not mean there are so many other trials going on right now. There may be a positive trial or um, there may be a role for this drug in people that aren't as sick to prevent them from getting sick. So there's still so much more um, uh, that we need to find out. But just a, again, in a week, we've, we've um, heard about, um, you know, there was a lot of hope resting on, on two drugs, both of which um, it's not quite worked out the way people have hoped. Dr. Anton Bilchik from Los Angeles, thank you so much for giving us this week's update. It sounds a little bit like the more you find out, the less you know, but hopefully we'll be back uh, next week to see what happens in a week. Thank you so much for joining me in Atlanta. Thank you.